How did Jorge Polanco, Luisa Rise, and Miguel Sano perform in 2021? Coming up next on Locked On Twins. You are Locked On Twins. Your daily Minnesota Twins podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. And welcome to the Lockdown Minnesota Twins podcast. Today is Monday, October 25th, and I'm your gracious host, Nash Walker. Thank you for making Lockdown Twins your first listen every day. Really excited starting the YouTube journey today. Please consider subscribing to the channel. I'd also recommend that you check out Lockdown Vikings with Luke Braun. Check out Lockdown Wild with Seth, to- Seth Topol and Lockdown Timberwolves with Ben Beacon as well. But I'm excited to get the YouTube going And we're talking Twins report cards. We've had our report cards for the starting rotation. We started with the left side of the infield last week with Andrelton Simmons and Josh Donaldson. Also have articles coming out at TwinsDaily.com, breakdowns on the rotations, grades. We have the infield coming out this week. We'll have the outfield and the bullpen next week. So check that out for a deeper look at some of those grades. But we're going to continue with that today on the right side. And we're going to lump in Luis Arise as an outfielder in our uh, Twins Daily write-up. But I have him as an infielder here, Jorge Polanco, Miguel Sano. We're going to lump those three together today. And I guess the main news of the day, and and I guess why we're also kind of drawing out and pacing ourselves early this offseason, is that it does sound like there will be a work stoppage with the CBA. And this sucks, and this is what we expected. And I think that there was some strategy that went into this for the Twins, perhaps at the deadline, thinking that maybe the 2022 season would be somewhat compromised. I still think that's a long shot. I think they'll start on time. I think there'll be 162 games next year. Um, But it sounds like there's going to be a work stoppage and it's not a surprise based on what went down in the shortened season and the negotiations between uh, Major League Baseball and the MLBPA. So, you know, we can hope for the best. There's no control here. You hope that they get something done. You hope that the free agency and and offseason isn't compromised too much because of the CBA negotiations. But there's definitely a chance and it seems like it's a certainty that they will be in some way, shape or form. And and my whole thing here with the Twins and and their offseason is to be aggressive, right, to go for it early. And and they might be restricted in that they may not be able to do that because they don't know the rules for the 2022 season and beyond expanded playoffs, universal DH, all those things impact all of these teams. They impact trades, they impact free agent signings, and we may not know about them until February. I mean, it's there's a chance that this goes on and there's just that flurry of signings at the end of the offseason similar to what we saw last year kind of you know you saw the twins make a ton of moves in a couple weeks nelson cruz alexander Colme, i think we're one day apart jay hat matt shoemaker they signed all these guys later in the offseason andrelton simmons and that was just kind of the way that free agency went last year the big guys signed a little later as well you know george springer um so that that could be how it goes again this year i'm hoping not i'm hoping there's a chance that we see a bunch of signings before december 2nd when the cba expires so players get their money and they have that certainty of this current CBA still being in play until December 2nd. But we don't know what will happen. Remains to be seen. And, you know, all we can do is is just follow and see uh, how this offseason progresses and, and to evaluate it from a Twins perspective. The best thing for them moving forward, not only in 2022, but beyond as well. And, and this offseason, as I've said so many times, is critical. It's so important that they have a good offseason even if they're not planning on contending in 2022, hitting on their trades that they make, hitting on free agent signings, more more pivotal than ever under this regime. This is the biggest offseason they've had. And I don't think I said this last year. I think I said last year, 2021, was a pivotal season in their contention cycle. It was you have this White Sox team coming after them, if not the favorite, the co-favorite in the division. How would the Twins manage in that situation where they're now the hunted? And I've talked about hunter versus hunted. Twins are now going to go back to being the hunter, which I think is a good thing for them. I think it's good um, to have that that drive. I think there's pros and cons when you're the hunted. That means you're the favorite, which puts you in the driver's seat. But when you're the hunter, it kind of gives you that chip that you want to be better than the team you're hunting. And that's the White Sox. Could be Detroit. Kansas City could be getting better. Cleveland is ahead of the Twins right now after – the season that the twins just had, but 
Um, I don't think it takes a whole lot to get back to that level. It's getting to the White Sox level, getting to a level that they can compete in the American League. And in this offseason is so crucial in determining that. Let's look at Jorge Polanco, just a major positive. And so many nights this year, so many postgame episodes that I that I uh, recorded and produced and posted, so many of them were negative and so many of them were kind of deeper meaning. What does this team have? How many negatives? You know, the trade deadline, losing players that we love. But a common theme, especially in the second half, was the excellence of Jorge Polanco, how amazing he was in carrying this lineup for a lot of the year and what made Polo's season so great. Because if you look at it from the surface, Josh Donaldson actually, by the numbers, had a more productive season offensively than Jorge Polanco. But we know Josh Donaldson's not the team MVP. He may not even be second in team MVP, MVP voting. And the reason for that is Polo did it in huge spots. The value he provided in high leverage situations, hitting with runners in scoring position. He had three walk-offs in a row. Twins had, I think they won three out of four, and Polo walked walked off three of those, those three wins. He walked off, which is amazing. Uh, just unbelievable when the Twins needed him all year. And you could argue like the Twins didn't need him at all. They were out of contention very early, and he struggled, really struggled early. And I could say, yeah, that's true, but – Without Jorge Polanco, I think this Twins team decombusts after the trade deadline. I think it absolutely breaks down. And, and so much of their success this year in those final two months, and they didn't have very much success, but the success that they did have, I mean, can be credited to Jorge Polanco. Let's look at his season after this word from DirecTV. I want to tell you about DirecTV Stream. Does this sound familiar? You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows. You're watching sports highlights on your phone and you've got your neighbor's best friends log in for the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream and it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion Get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. I also want to thank you for making Lockdown Twins your first listen every day. We are free and available on all podcast platforms. So let's look at Jorge Polanco, the expectation. It's a pivotal year. And I wrote actually before the season, one of the very few things I've gotten right, I got right about the 2021 Twins. I said Jorge Polanco was due for a resurgent 2021 with a finely healthy ankle. It just felt like he was going to bounce back, but I didn't expect it in this way. I expected, you know, and at that time with the way, and I talk about this regularly because of the situation the Twins are in at shortstop, the bar, the offensive bar for second baseman is now below that of a shortstop. And so if you could get for Jorge Polanco, if you could get, a 260 batting average with a 330 on base percentage and a 450 slugging percentage and 20, 25 homers and solid defense at second. That is a huge contributor contributor for you, especially at second base because that bar is lower. So he's going to be one of the best hitting second baseman in the league. He was only Marcus Semyon was better really in the American league. Jorge Polanco was terrific and it was a pivotal year because the twins signed into that extension looked brilliant for it in the first half of 2019 he breaks down in the second half after the all-star break then in 2020 as an 82 ops plus he's 18 percent below league average in the short in 2020 season so this is a pivotal year like what who is jorge polanco at that point and i think we learned so much that that ankle was really holding him back and pakota didn't think he was gonna have that great of a year and i don't blame him you know, they, they thought he'd be productive, hit 268, you know, OPS in the 750 range, 11 homers, 25 doubles, productive season, under two wins above replacement. So, you know, slightly above replacement level, and especially for a second baseman. Um, but the results were amazing. He hit 269. So Pakota was actually like right on with that number and really close on on base. The difference was the power. Uh, Polo slugged almost 100 points more than Pakota projected him to. Had 33 homers, 35 doubles, two triples. He was worth almost five wins instead of the two that Pakota said. And those are always a little bit conservative. But he was worth almost five wins. Solid defense at second, like I said, was valuable. And he was the team MVP. So Jorge Polanco, resounding A-plus for the season he put together for the Twins. And it's so important as we look forward to 2022. Knowing that Polo's on that extension, knowing that he's back next year at second base, can play a little short, 
Um, it's a it's a big thing because there are a lot of uncertainties on this on this roster on the offensive side. I know there's a ton of pitching questions, ton of pitching questions, but on the offensive side, I've made the argument that the number one decision of the offseason, number one storyline of the offseason is Byron Buxton. And he's a position player. What are they going to do with Josh Donaldson? Position player. Is Miguel Sano? Does he have a future on this team? Position player. There's a lot of questions on the position player side as well. One of them is not Jorge Polanco. And there's immense value in that. Just knowing you have a number three hitter, switch hitter, playing second base every single day for you is extremely valuable for the Twins in 2022. And maybe more importantly, beyond. Because they have to consider, who do we want to keep? And I I said this a lot of during the season. I said this a lot during the season. They have to decide who from this core, Miguel Sano, Byron Bucks, and Jorge Polanco. Jose Barrios was part of that, and they decided, you know, without an extension, it was the best decision to trade him. Who did Max Kepler? Who do they want to keep? Mitch Garver, that whole core. Who's gonna who's gonna remain for this next core of hopefully a productive Jose Miranda, Austin Martin, Royce Lewis group, uh, Alex Kirloff, Trevor Larnick, Jordan Balazovic in the rotation with Yuan Duran and Louis Varlin and those guys, this next wave. Who do they want to keep? And I think Jorge Polanco answered the question for himself in 2021 that he's a guy you want to keep. And and like I said, to have a switch hitter who was almost just as good from the right side last year when in in previous years his left-handed power has been his strength, was good from the right side. I tweeted at one point because he had a home run from the right side. I said, righty polo got jealous of lefty polo. Um, He was good from both sides of the plate, strong second baseman. Um, and just this, this version of him is a very underrated player and a very valuable player. He hit 33 home runs this year from the second base spot. That's huge. And then if you consider that the twins want to sign a shortstop, if they do get involved, and I think they will be involved in negotiations potentially with Carlos Correa, Marcus Semien, Javier Baez, Trevor Story. I mean, imagine the power you could have up the middle. I remember seeing a tweet. I apologize. I can't remember who tweeted it, but Imagine if the Twins had signed Marcus Semien, who they were, it sounded like very close to signing last year. We had articles like ready at Twins Daily to break the news or to break down the news. Imagine if it would have been Semien Polanco up the middle, 70 combined home runs up the middle of the infield. They could have that in 2022 if they end up signing one of those great shortstops, one of those power bats on the free agent market. Uh, and that's huge. I mean, that raises the ceiling that I always talk about, the ceiling of the 2022 team. How can it be raised? Jorge Polanco helps immensely with that at second base because he allows you to potentially have that up-the-middle duo along with Buxton in center and Garver at catcher. I mean, if you sign one of those great shortstops, and that's a big if, but those four up the middle in the premium spots at short, center, catcher, second base may not be a more powerful quartet there than Garver, Buxton, Polanco, and maybe Semyon or, or Baez or Correa or Story, or whoever the Twins uh, may end up with, which is amazing. Let's talk about Miguel Sano and Larissa Rise after this word from Built Bar. Built Bar is the most delicious protein bar ever. There's something for everyone. And when you talk to a Built Bar fan, they're definitely passionate about their faves, but the, the flavors are so vast and so delicious. Coconut, cherry, barcia, raspberry, mint brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel, my favorite flavor is mint chocolate. It really is amazing. Um, it's sweet, but it's also very healthy. 17 to 18 grams of protein, calories ranging from 130 to 180, only four to five grams of net carbs, amazing flavors, all tasty, all healthy. You can order today and get the grasshopper cookie or raspberry or whatever you like. Built Bar is the official protein bar of the U.S. track and field team. Isn't that neat? You go to built.com and use promo code locked on. You'll get 15% off your order. Use promo code locked on for 15% off at built.com. Staying in the infield, the right side of the infield, Miguel Sano, expectation. Sometimes it makes a whole lot of sense to just combine the last two years and say that's the expected line. I think that's true for Miguel Sano. 2019 and 2020 hit 233, 325 on base, slugged 544. He was good for 28% better than league average. In 158 games from 2019 and 2020 combined, Snow hit 47 homers and drove in over 100 runs with 31 doubles. That is an extremely valuable bat. 47 homers in 158 games if you combine 19 and 20, the shortened 2020 season and his 2019 season. Um, but that doesn't come with just a straight across line, right? That has periods where he's hitting 400 with a thousand slugging percentage, and then it comes with periods where he's hitting a buck 25 with a 60% strikeout rate. So Pakoda understanding all of this, his projection for 2021, they they expected him to hit 231 with a 325 on base percentage, slug 479, 31 homers, 25 doubles. Actually had him for over three wins above replacement, which to me is that's aggressive. I mean, they they like his talent. 
and Pakoda had him for over three and a half wins above replacement. For comparison, they had Jorge Polanco for 1.77. So, you know, a little less than three times what they had Miguel Sano for. What actually happened is he hit 223. On base was about 13 points less, slugged less than his projection, was just 13% above league average, which for a first baseman is really not that great. Did hit 30 home runs, had 24 doubles, was worth just under one win at baseball reference, drove in 75 runs. Again, you can split Miguel Sano's season, and sometimes you can split it into five parts, 10 parts, 12 parts. I'll split it into two to make it simple. From April 1st to June 2nd, he hit a buck 57 with a weighted runs created plus of 79. It was worth negative ones above replacement. And then from June 3rd to the end of the season, hit 250 with a 123 weighted runs created plus, and it was worth just under one win above replacement. Um, it was a disappointing year for Miguel Sano, even if you factor in how good he was over the last couple months. It was disappointing. He didn't reach that projection. He didn't reach that expectation. His defense at first at times wasn't the best. Um, I thought he made some decent plays, and I thought he progressed a little bit there. But it was a disappointing year, and for all those reasons, a C-minus for Miguel Sano. Luis Arise expectations this year. I expected him to hit like 320, 380 on base percentage, 400 slugging percentage, five homers, 130 games. Biggest thing for Luis is just staying healthy. Uh, biggest thing for him is just playing in as many games as possible. His knees have been an issue. His knees may continue to be an issue. They were in 2021. Again, Pakoda projected some regression. They had him hitting 299, 356 on base, slugging percentage 400, so the same as I expected. Um, five home runs, same as I expected, with just over two wins above replacement. What ended up happening is this, a line that was almost identical to what Pakoda projected, so regression. Uh, Louis ended up hitting 294, 357 on base, hit two homers, uh, Baseball reference had him for 3.4 wins above replacement, so a really solid regular, and then Fangrass was under two. You can split Luis' uh, season up in 3-2. First 88 games, he hit 314 with a 381 on base percentage, so the, the Luis arise we've come to know. And then his next 24 games, he hit 157 with a 237 on base percentage. And the thing with Louis and, and why there might be some trade discussion perhaps this offseason is when he's doing this and if he's streaky like this where he goes on 24 game stretches and this will happen over 162 and over a career but if he goes on stretches like this where he's hitting 157 with a 230 on base percentage that is less valuable than when Miguel Sano does it because Sano will run into a couple homers and sometimes they're big homers Louis not going to run into any homers so when he's struggling like he is he doesn't really merit being in the lineup because defensively he's a negative in most spots as well. I will say, I think it's over hyped, I guess, or overstated how poor he is defensively. He was worth an out above average at third base. So slightly above average second base was bad, negative three. And then in left field was negative one. So not awful, but not a big enough sample size to really create a case at any of those spots. I think he's pretty decent at third, although that throw in Oakland kind of changes people's minds. Uh, but his last nine games of the season, he kind of saved himself, went 15 for 33, hit 455. So on the season, you know, solid year for Louie. I think we expected more. I expected more, was hoping he would play more games. Um, but this is right on par with what Pakota projected for him. So with all of that in mind, like if a player gets a B in these report cards, I guess it's that they met expectations and met projections. And maybe they'll have a B plus based on how they hit in high leverage spots and things like that. Um but Luis Rise gets a B minus because I think the expectations are higher. And now he's entering what could be his first year of arbitration. He's right on the border of a super two. Sounds like he's going to get paid about a million and a half. He's got four years of team control left. And yeah, like there is redundancy on this roster with Kepler and Arise and Larnick and Kirilov coming. Um, there's redundancy here. And if he's not gonna, if he's not gonna be consistent enough for you. I think that does open up the possibility of looking into trading him for arms. I think people quickly jump to Max Kepler and Miguel Sano being the two guys that you would move this offseason. But when you think about value, like Kepler has value because he's a good defender, definitely. And because he had such a good year in 2019 and has that power potential. But also, like he, he's that was an outlier year. And we've talked about Max too. And we'll do Max's report card and talk about how 2019 was an outlier for Miguel Sano. Less than stellar defense at first base, the strikeouts, um, you know, the inconsistencies, the contract, most of all, brings his value down. If you're really looking, and, and it's the reason that people jump to Kepler and Sano is because they're not super impressed with Kepler and Sano. And if you're not super impressed with Kepler and Sano, what makes you think that 
I don't know, the Cincinnati Reds would trade Sonny Gray for Max Kepler and Miguel Sano. Like it's, it has to go both ways. And, and I know a lot of fans love Luis Arise. I love Luis Arise, but there has to be pain. There's no gain without pain. And you watch Bruce Dar Gratterall throwing 100 mile an hour sinkers, 102 mile an hour sinkers in the playoffs this year. That's your pain for the Kenta Maeda. And it's a little bit different for Bruce Dar. Um, you know, that trade was different. Kenta was so good in the shortened season, but now undergoing Tommy John and Bruce Dar's catching up. The Dodgers are catching up if you look at that trade as a race, right? So there's there's no gain without pain. And for Luis Arise, I think he has obviously more value than Sano and Kepler, probably more than Sano and Kepler combined, because a lot of teams do value, I think, that top of the order, left-handed bat, the utility of him. He can play second, can play third, is really not that bad in most spots and also is under team control for four years at really cheap salaries. So I think for Luis Arise, he's a name to watch this off season gets a B minus for 2021. Thank you so much for listening to locked on twins. Thank you for making locked on twins. Your first listen every day tomorrow. We will continue on. We're going to get to the outfield and we're moving. We're moving and grooving as the world series gets underway this week. Uh, we'll also do a little world series preview tomorrow as well make your second list in lockdown mlb prospects host aram Waiten is a prospect encyclopedia and he's going deep on the mlb stars of tomorrow it's free and available on all platforms aram has talked about jose miranda he loves alex kirilov he's a fan of trevor larnick he's great go listen to aram thanks again for listening follow me on twitter at nash walker nine follow the show at lockdown twins hope you enjoyed the youtube let me know what you think subscribe to the channel thanks so much